Nadia Falter, welcome to today's talk, which is called Trust Women. And this event brings together four formidable campaigners for reproductive rights to discuss the challenges in the current context and reflect on the significance of legislative changes in Ireland, North and South. So our speakers include Gronya Taggart, who's from Amnesty International, Ava Smith, who's from the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment, Rory Rowan, who's from Informing Choices, Northern Ireland, and Kelly O'Dowd, who's from Abortion Talk, and Kelly will also chair. This event is part of this year's special hybrid festival with some events back live and outdoors, and events such as our talks and debates once again being held online brought to you by Failure on Farble in partnership with St. Mary's University College, the Irish News and the Kennedy Centre. So Kelly, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. And thank you everybody for attending our Trust Women, the campaign to realise reproductive rights in Ireland. I'm delighted to be joined by, as um, Joanna has already said, a, a great uh, panel and hopefully our, our discussions are going to be interesting this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kelly O'Dowd. I'm a feminist and trade union activist, and I'm programme manager now for a brand new charity called Abortion Talk, which seeks to destigmatize abortion and create safe space for, uh, for discussions around abortion, because we already know that one in three women will access a, an abortion in her lifetime. I'd like to, to my right, introduce Rory Rowan. He's the director of advocacy and policy for the sexual and reproductive health charity Informing Choices. And since April 2020, Informing Choices have been providing a central helpline into early medical abortion services in Northern Ireland. And we're gonna delve into that a wee bit more. So Alva, Alva Smith, longtime feminist and LGBTIQ campaigner, founding head of Women's Studies in UCD, a co-founded and led coalition to repeal the eighth and was co-director of Together for Yes campaign. And last but certainly not least, Grania Taggart, as she's campaigns manager for Amnesty UK in, nor in the North or Northern Ireland. She played a key role in overturning the abortion ban here via Westminster and through the courts and continues to advocate for fully accessible human rights compliant local services. So you're all very welcome. And um, yeah, we've had some interesting discussions and news today, but I think we should start really, Rory, with you. Um, so, you know, we know you've been providing the, the, the central service and we know that between April 20 and 21, 2,200 people availed of the central helpline, helpline service. So tell us how this came about. Tell us how this, how this works. Well, essentially, we, we had the most restrictive law uh, in, in Europe um, in relation to abortion. Very few people were able to access the service locally, and the majority of people either had to access the service either by travelling to, to Great Britain or further afield or, or accessing medication online. Um, we, we then overturned um, that, that long uh, abortion pan, uh, ban through legislation at, at Westminster, uh, and we had new regulations that were introduced in, in March of, of 2020. Uh, but those regulations came at a time where we were entering uh, the first lockdown in UK. Um, COVID uh, was now uh, taking centre stage um, across the world and we had uh, bans in relation to um, uh, hotels being closed, uh, people not being able to, to leave their houses, uh, flights being grounded and essentially it meant that uh, for women seeking access to abortion in Northern Ireland they, they, had, no, they had no alternative other than potentially travelling over a three-day period uh, on the ferry to uh, to England um, when the rest of the UK were being told to stay at home. It was not a safe or, or viable option uh, for people. And because of that, um, Informing Choices worked alongside a number of healthcare professionals in Northern Ireland to provide interim services uh, until the full commissioning process um, was to begin. Um, and so during that period, um, there were a number of health trusts um, that, that were able to provide um, early medical uh, abortion access in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. Um, but because we were working with skeleton numbers of staff, um, uh, there needed to be a central access um, a, a way that people could access those services um, uh, no matter where they lived in Northern Ireland and, and ICNI and I um, stepped in to, to fill that void. Um, we have a, a helpline that, that people across Northern Ireland can, can contact. Um, they can access non-directive information. Um, they can access pregnancy choices counselling um, if requested um, and, they can, uh, and they can then be referred into a local um, early medical uh, abortion service. Um, we also then provide um, post-pregnancy counselling for, for anyone who wishes to avail of that afterwards. Um, as you said, Kelly, in, in the first year of, of providing that, that interim service, almost 2,200 women um, contacted ICNI. 
Um, they came from, from all parts uh, of Northern Ireland um, and not everyone who will access our service um, will, will, will have made up their decision in relation to their, their pregnancy choices. We will always begin a conversation by saying that there's three options available to you, either to continue with the pregnancy, adoption or abortion. Uh, most people will have made that decision and will then be seeking onward referral. Uh, but for some, because we have such a lack of information about services um, in the north, they will be calling us to find out how do you avail of services, where are they located, um, uh, what, what would that mean in terms of, of accessing them locally. So we will go through that process with them and then on a daily basis we will make a referral into um, each individual trust. Um, as we said, that service has been provided uh, on an unfunded basis um, on, on the last number um, for the last 15 months. And I'm sure as, as the conversation develops, we'll discuss that impact uh, in terms of our counselling service and on, on the wider services that are, that are being provided in the trust. But certainly uh, we're in a better place than what we were uh, when the regulations were introduced. Um, previous, uh, in the previous year in Northern Ireland, nine people accessed abortion services locally. Uh, we now know that since the regulations were introduced, over 1,600 people have been able to access services locally. So while full services aren't commissioned, uh, we are in a much better place uh, now than what we were uh, 15 months ago, um, and, and we can continue to move forward. Great, Rory, thanks. And just leading on from that, Gronya, so we got some good news today. Uh, we know that the Secretary of State today has directed Stormont's Department of Health to set up full abortion services in Northern Ireland no later than March 2022. And I know indeed Amnesty and um, Informant Choices were involved with the Northern, Human, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's decision to initiate legal action against the Secretary of State, the Executive and the Department of Health about commissioning these services. So could you talk us through kind of what happened from, I suppose, the change in the law to the announcement that's made today? I mean, the change in the law was, of course, a, a defining moment in the fight for women's rights here and for reproductive rights. We had went from having one of the most restrictive abortion laws globally. Um, our laws carried the harshest criminal penalties in Europe. Prosecutions were a reality. You know, I was working with the legal team of a mother who was being prosecuted for buying abortion pills for her daughter. And then um, through the advocacy, both through the courts and at Westminster, we arrived at a situation where we had um, very robust, CEDAW compliant, human rights compliant, abortion law and that's always of course the space we should have been in regrettably though um despite overturning the law what we didn't see was uh, the action that was needed by our local health minister to actually deliver and commission those services to ensure that they were accessible to everyone who needed them so um in that intervening period you know whilst we were advocating strongly for the health department and indeed for further action from the northern ireland office around this particular point um, the reality was that neither were moving at a fast enough pace and particularly in the context of the pandemic what we couldn't continue to accept was a situation where this healthcare was being exported that women and others were having to travel and that you know beyond that um 10 weeks you know we had what sort of i defined an amnesty as a, as a postcode lottery for provision because of course it different points during this pandemic for early medical abortion services those um, services have collapsed because we have been reliant in some trust areas for example just on one healthcare professional to sustain this service and that's obviously a lot of pressure to be putting our healthcare professionals under it was an impossible position that our health minister left our health trusts in because effectively the services are lawful no one could be refused this health care but nor were they being given adequate resource to actually deliver these new services so that was a very compromised position that our health care professionals were in so um like the, the fight to overturn the law, it was very clear that this was going to require a combination of the advocacy at Westminster and fighting through the courts again. And what the court case was about, taken by the Human Rights Commission and Amnesty and Informing Choices jointly intervened in that case. And what effectively that means is that we put evidence before the court to really underscore how urgent the need was to get these services commissioned. But we're relieved that, you know, obviously um, the 22nd of July, the Northern Ireland office, the Secretary of State has directed the health department here in the north to commission those services. So we, what we expect now to happen is that those services will be in place at the very latest the 31st of March 2022 of course it doesn't have to take that long it depends at the pace you know that now that now happens um but also um the key point here between now and March 2022 is that we have to see what interim arrangements have been able to be put in place to be sustained so that of course includes the central access point through informing choices but it also has to include the support being given to our individual trusts 
um, to sustain these services whilst those full clear pathways are established. So we don't have the judgment um, in that case. And obviously now we have the, the services that instruction has been given. But from our point of view as Amnesty, we will continue to monitor um, compliance, obviously, with this law and ensuring that everyone who needs access to an abortion has it. Great, Grania, thank you. Alvi, three years since, you know, the referendum. Could you reflect a wee bit and tell us, you know, how it's been, what it looks like, um, you know, the, the great moment, I suppose, of rubber peel happening and seeing the signs, you know, the North is next, but we're three years on. So give us yeah. some, ref give us some of your reflections. Well, you know, first of all, I, that's a very big question and it would, <laughs> there could be an extremely long answer. So I will try to be very uh, outline and say, you know, even just listening now to Gronia and to Rory, I'm just thinking to myself, here we are living on the island of Ireland in, you know, with legal abortion. Now, this is not to say we're living on a perfect island, far from it, or with perfect access, far from it. But that in itself, if, if I look back over my own lifetime of campaigning, that is an absolutely massive shift. That's absolutely huge. And it's it's huge in a very practical way in terms of, of, of the women and pregnant people who need abortion. But it is also, I think, absolutely momentous on other levels as well. And I would say that, you know, just to, it, it's taken me actually a couple of years to understand even the enormity of, of that shift, because when, when it happens, you think, right, we get on with the next step and so on and so forth. And it does take a little bit of time to understand what the repercussions are in a broader way. And I think it's really important for us, actually, all island to, to think about those kinds of repercussions. But I would say that first and foremost, you know, what, what strikes me is that we did remove that prohibition against abortion. That happened through repeal um, in the South and it has happened here up in the North um, uh, as well through a different mechanism. But in both cases, the, um, the, the, the grassroots political movement led by feminists and pro-choice and human rights activists has been really, really important. And I think that that in itself is really interesting because it is actually saying to people and perhaps particularly to young people, what you do on the ground, your grassroots politics really matters. It can actually function in our democratic societies to bring about the kind of changes we need. And I mean, I think in, in, in a world where we are increasingly looking at an encroaching um, extreme right wing, I think that those victories here in Ireland have been incredibly emboldening and empowering for our whole political system. So I think that there is that very wide uh, base of change that seems to me to be really important. And I mean, certainly just speaking for the South, I mean, OK, there were a lot of there were some very much older people like me uh, involved, but fundamentally it was actually driven on the ground by young people, mainly young women and girls, but a lot of young men as well were roped in, drawn in and understanding about human rights uh, politics. So removing that ban has been incredibly important um, on, on that wider political level, but also, of course, in on the ground that we were you know, on which we were fighting for. It has meant that women can have abortions in Ireland now. And while, you know, the law is very defective, and I know we'll come back to maybe that later, I do want to say that in 2019, the figures are dated, that's the, the, the year for which we have the latest figures, show that 7,000 women and pregnant people accessed abortion in the South. And I mean, that is absolutely massive when you think that there was a lower number going to Britain every year for abortion. So it definitely is opening things up. And sometimes young women say to me, oh, we failed. The law doesn't go far enough. No, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. In fact, we shouldn't have laws at all, I think. But of course it doesn't go far enough. But 7,000 seems to me to be, you know, 7,000 women saved the misery, the distress, the agony, the secrecy, the stigma of that awful, lonely, mortifying, humiliating uh, trek over to, to Britain is fantastic. There are still women travelling and we can come back to those reasons, uh, but nonetheless. And the, I suppose really the last point I would make is that um, I do think that if we see um, 
the abortion referendum in the South on top of the marriage equality referendum. And indeed, I remember speaking up in in, um, in Belfast after immediately after uh, the marriage equalization of marriage in the north and saying you know we have two big hits coming uh, here um that has absolutely broken our link with the authoritarian catholic past and however that shapes up in the future it is absolutely not the same something has been irretrievably, incontrovertibly uh, broken. Uh, that's a very wide question. I'm happy to come back to the detail answer. I'm happy to come back to the details of which there are many uh, for the, the challenges that lie ahead. Great, thanks, Alvi. Murray, um, I know Informant Choices published a report in June um, of this year entitled Beyond Decriminalization, Pregnancy Choices and Abortion Care in Northern Ireland. What were the key findings from that report? The, the, the reasoning to, to police the report was around shining a spotlight on the services that have been in place um, over um, over the past 14 months um, and, and in racially just building on that because there's there's free information in the public domain about what services um, um, have been available on the ground and, and, and the challenges that have remained because of the fact that they've been operating in, in an uncommissioned um, environment. Um, so I suppose the, the report begins uh, with a woman who um, um, shares her experience of accessing a Abortion services um, now in the north. Um, uh, since the the early medical abortion services have been uh, been in place, and and really the the relief in in not having to travel to an unfamiliar environment, um, to not having to have the uncertainty of of accessing medication online, and and the ability to be able to access that service locally in in, in a healthcare facility that she's known her whole life. Um, so it, that was sort of the the starting point in the report, and then it it builds in terms of healthcare professionals experience and, and other individuals in ICNI of, of providing those services, how how those services were rapidly rapidly in, implemented um over over the space of of, of a week uh, essentially to get them to get them throughout um throughout Northern Ireland um in terms of um in terms of what it has meant the fact that they've been provided without uh, commissioning and, and Grania highlighted the fact that there have been a number of early medical abortion services that have been suspended at various points over the past year and because uh, we have been we have had that lack of resources there have been instances where in in certain trust areas a single individual has been responsible for the operation of the entire service within that trust um one of those healthcare professionals um who was providing the service in the western health trust wrote about her experience of providing that service with no support and and how that service um has ultimately now been suspended because of that lack of uh, of support um there was other healthcare professionals writing about the impact of protests which i'm sure we might come back later in terms of uh, in terms of what women have had to face in terms of accessing the services and the wider impact that's had on on healthcare professionals and others accessing healthcare um in northern ireland and um, it reflected in terms of our our counseling service um over the past year and how that has now expanded it it has been de delivered as a telephone counseling service now um and during the course of the pandemic and in terms of the numbers now accessing our counseling service and particularly our our post-pregnancy counseling um and that is for anyone um, who wishes to discuss either a, a pregnancy loss which may be through abortion it may be through miscarriage or stillbirth it may be a traumatic birth or um or, or postnatal depression postnatal anxiety and we've seen the growth of of that service um over the past year because we are now speaking with 45 women a week um so more people are now accessing our services and that has had an impact in terms of the services um that that, 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 that we have been providing over that that period of time in terms of of those suspension of trusts we've reflected on women's experiences of being informed that because of where they happen to live in northern ireland there isn't a service that they're able to avail of and um and the fact that how unfair that is that um that that, that postcode lottery um exists um and we've spoken to a number of women who um have basically said because of covid and and, it, and even even outside of the, the the impact of covid travel is not feasible it's not practical in many cases it's been scary over the past year when you think about when some of when some of these services have been collapsed, they have been at, at the height um, of, of COVID transmission. Um, and, and the fact that while it wouldn't be their preferred option, the majority of people will be accessing abortion services online 
um, rather than accessing through the funded um, scheme in Great Britain. Um, so we, we've reflected on, on those experiences as well and sort of wider things going forward in terms of public health information campaigns. The fact that there isn't general information about how you access services um, in Northern Ireland. Um, the fact that the misinformation that's out there in terms of people's experiences when they contact their, their GP who may often be the first point of, of contact for many. So reflecting on, on what's needed in terms of going forward in terms of the, the wider commissioning, in terms of the um, what's needed in terms of contraception services. Um, this should be a, a full service that, that's commissioned um, and, the, and there have been um, uh, one of the, the benefits of having that local service in place is the, the uptake of, of LARC, long-acting reversible contraception. Uh, now everyone is being offered a form of contraception in terms of treatment. I know in, it, it varies in trust to trust, but there is around 50% uptake of LARC of people accessing services. Um, so, so how we can build on, on contraception availability, which has been patchy across the North for, for many years um, and going forward just in terms of the wider commissioning of what's needed. And I think significantly what the report um, stated was that if funding is not in place by the 1st of October, ICNI would have to cease providing the central access point. We, we have been providing it unfunded. Um, it has had an impact in terms of our small staff team. It's had an impact in terms of the demand for our counselling service. And it was, it was certainly not sustainable um, for, for any longer than that. Thankfully, um, the 22nd of July today, that we have received that, that announcement from the Secretary of State, which does include uh, an immediate direction to fund ICNI and support ICNI to continue providing that central access point. So uh, hopefully that, that, that will develop in the coming days and, and we'll see the, the sort of that, that wider expansion of our services and that sort of high quality information support, uh, support and, and counselling service that we've been providing over the last 15 months. Thanks, Rory. <clears throat> I'd like to reflect on something that you said um, with Grania around um, protesters. So Informant Choices, formerly Family Plan Association, you are no strangers to protesters, but even the services that were being provided in Northern Ireland, and I'm thinking of the footage that I saw on Facebook at John Mitchell Place in Uri or the hospitals in Ballymena. And <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, Grania, you know, there is this kind of the, the debate or the human rights debate around protesters and their impact about restricting peaceful protest and restricting free speech versus the right to privacy and family life and the right to access healthcare without being intimidated. So can you talk to us a wee bit about those, I suppose, those conflicting rights and the impact again on even the services that are being provided at the minute and what the, what, what's happening with the protesters? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like most things, it's a balance and exercise of rights and, you know, government does have certain obligations and responsibilities that it has to um, facilitate and to um, uh, uh, to fulfil. So if we consider for a moment those who are protesting outside of the sites where our healthcare professionals are providing these services and women are obviously accessing these services, you know, the right to protest is not absolute. And, you know, there are many who would actually argue with the notion that what we are witnessing here is actually a protest, that it obviously is quite clearly in some instances harassment and intimidation. And mm -hmm. when that happens, then our government has an obligation to ensure that there are no barriers to women and to our healthcare professionals in accessing and providing these services. So the balancing of rights, in my view, actually firmly comes down on the side of those accessing healthcare because the right to health trumps the right to protest. And what we are seeing here is very sophisticated campaigns of intimidation and harassment, and that's not acceptable. It's why we urgently need safe access zones outside the healthcare sites where women are accessing this provision, because without that, what we're going to continue to see is some people intimidated away from obviously accessing services. And also you could have a situation where someone isn't there to access an abortion service at all. Someone who's maybe had an experience of miscarriage and they're being traumatized by what they are witnessing, whether it's the images or indeed some of the grotesque behavior of some of the protesters, if that's obviously how they like to refer to themselves. So where things are at the minute is that the Northern Ireland office is gonna keep under review, as they put it, the need for um, safe access zones. We're very clear that actually these are needed, that we can see now that they're needed. So there is urgency around this. And we do have an opportunity through Claire Bailey's private members bill, which is before the assembly to actually introduce these safe access zones. So it is not telling people you don't have a right to protest. What it's about is creating a safe and enabling space for people to access this healthcare. So I would urge our executive parties to ensure that the time is actually given in this mandate to this bill. 
The other option is, of course, that there we have a Department of Justice that our, our Justice Minister Naomi Long um, could, could bring this forward, that she could introduce, obviously, these, these safe access zones. Um, none of us really care about, obviously, who does it. The bottom line is actually that it happens because it will only be now through the commissioning of these services and through um, people accessing these services freely and that the, you know people accept that this is just one experience of a woman's reproductive lifetime um, and that we get to a point where this healthcare is normalized and properly in our society and properly embedded within our healthcare system. And one of the ways, of course, we do that is that this just becomes, you know, routine. So a fully accessed resource service that is sustainable is one way to do that. So too is removing um, some of the barriers that we're witnessing at the moment. And one of those barriers obviously is um, these protests. Yeah. Thanks, Sonia. Alvi, could you reflect a wee bit about um, the barriers to access in the Republic for us? Certainly, I know around conscientious objection. I know, I know, I think I heard last year there was no abortion access in Donegal, for example, or Letterkenny. So, you know, we have this legislation. It's embedded and down. I think the health minister has just announced a review, a three year review of, of the legislation and its implementation. But what are those barriers that, that are still existing in the South for us? Well, I mean, the three year review was actually built in, the commitment was built into the legislation itself. And obviously, we have an abortion working group, which is composed of, you know, a lot of the organisations who are involved in um, coalition and together for yes and repeal generally. And we've been working on making a joint submission, but also individual uh, submissions. And that's very important. And let me just pick up on, on Gronia's last point that, in fact, the uh, need for safe access zones is something which which is a very key uh, demand. While it's not actually covered in the legislation, we are asking the minister to consider issues which are not strictly speaking within the parameters of that existing piece of law, but to consider also for example, safe access zones. And we we were promised those, we didn't get them. Apparently there is a constitutional issue. It is, I am absolutely certain, around that very balance of rights, Gronia, that you were uh, talking about. Therefore, it is not insoluble. Uh, we are also um, continuing to ask for free contraception, which we were promised by the Minister for Health and which we didn't get, although there was a plan at one stage to make it available to um, to people under the between the ages of 18 and 25, at which, you know, every Every single uh, woman and you know <laughs> trans man who get, could get pregnant in Ireland was raised now have to say, excuse me, biology lesson coming down the line here for all of you. But you know, just to to look more specifically at that three year review and to think about it, um, it, it obviously means that the law itself is very restrictive. And I would say that this is not uncommon in abortion legislation, which tends to be about how best can you limit access to and uh, abortion generally. So it's, it, it is about putting restrictions and obstacles, not facilitating women to access uh, abortion, which is one of the reasons why I think we're much better off moving um, abortion care generally out of the law and into the health services, because it is not designed to facilitate, it is designed to limit and to obstruct. So we do have a law which is quite obstructive. Um, we only have uh, 12 weeks on request, so a very key demand is actually to remove the restrictions and specifically to remove the time limits. We have a three-day cooling off period uh, within that 12 weeks. Um, and, and you know that that's simply insulting to women so the three-day cooling off period needs to go the 12-week limit on on request needs to go and there is a further limit uh, which affects people who have a diagnosis of a um, fatal fetal anomaly of um, that the fetus basically is unlikely to survive beyond 28 days um, after birth and that time limit uh, should go as well because it is still very difficult for women to access um, abortion in Ireland when there is a diagnosis of a fatal fetal anomaly. It is proving difficult. Sometimes it is a question of perception. Women and couples are afraid they won't be able to access, so they go straight away to the UK. It is only for fatal fetal anomaly. That in itself is not always a 100% diagnosis and so on. So there are a lot of, of issues there. We also, after the 12 weeks generally, have an incredibly vague um, basis 
for abortion, which is if there is um, an immediate or urgent risk to uh, a woman's health, you know, or a serious risk to a woman's health. Those are actually medical decisions. And a serious is also a very broad a term which can be interpreted in many ways. So we think that that absolutely has to go because it is not enabling women to access abortion after 12 weeks when there are in fact risks to their health and well-being. So we would like to see at the very least the World Health Organization definition of health as including, for example, overall well-being and social uh, health being um, replacing that definition, although ideally we would just like to see that going entirely and, and have abortion available on request up to viability. And we will be making that request. Um, we would like to see conscientious subjection not necessarily removed. One of the difficulties and I'll try and be really brief here, is that services are very inadequate. I mean, we've been talking about the provision of services in the north, in the south, technically, um, services are available, but almost half of maternity units in general hospitals are not actually offering the full panoply. So Sligo uh, General Hospital only carries out um, abortions in the case of fatal fetal anomaly. Um, GPs around the country, many of them have conscientious objections and don't carry out medical uh, abortions within the first nine weeks and so on. So our service provision urgently needs attention. It's highly discriminatory, uh, creates many serious inequalities and so on. So there are a number of proposals there to improve the primary care uh, service and also to put in place uh, ambulatory gynae uh, clinics. So they're basically day attendance gynae clinics around the country. And that's a recommendation which comes from um, uh, which comes to us from research from the, the WHO. Um, you know, there are so many challenges for us there, but the big challenge is actually to get terms of reference for, for this review from the minister. He has now agreed to have an independent chair, uh, which is excellent. We fought for that and we got it. Now we want terms of reference that will go beyond um, the narrowness of the law itself. And it is a process. And I, I think that, you know, that's what we're all finding, that the law changes or a law is put in place. And then something that I certainly always said, that we would repeal the Eighth Amendment, and we did. But then the hard work begins to make sure that everybody who needs an abortion can actually access abortion decently and in humane and normal and respectful conditions. So that's where we're at very much in our, in the South at the moment. Great, Dalby, thanks. Rory, you know, the World Health Organization, I know we, we kind of, as, as abortion activists, we would use their stats all the time, but I think WHO really came into their own with the pandemic. So I think you could actually talk about the World Health Organization and most people will go, oh yes, I think I've heard of them. But I was looking up some of their stats and they were saying at least 22,800 women um, a year die as a result of complications of unsafe abortion. And between 2 million and 7 million women each year survive unsafe abortion, but sustain long-term damage or disease. Why do you think society has such a problem with seeing abortion as a public good? I mean, we would see it as a public good, but why do you think society has such a problem with seeing abortion as a public good? Well, I think if you take um, the island of Ireland, for example, oh, until the last number of years, we had next to no abortion access in Ireland. Um, abortion was exported uh, to England and people travelled in silence. It wasn't something that was discussed uh, in, in the vast majority of cases discussed publicly. Um, and if people weren't traveling um, in silence, they, they were accessing medication online um, and doing that in silence. And the reason for doing that, we know, is because we had uh, an abortion law that dated back to 1861 that made it a criminal offense uh, for people to, to access um, uh, the medication in that way at that time. And, and we know in terms of pr the provision of our counseling service at that stage, uh, in terms of uh, when, when, when a when people access pregnancy choices counselling uh, and you had that sort of discussion, the availability of abortion pills online, for example, came up uh, almost almost on a weekly basis in terms of um, in terms of accessing services. Yet we we never heard people discuss 
uh, in terms of a post-pregnancy counseling session, the fact that they'd accessed abortion medication online. And that's because they felt silenced and they mm -hmm. felt she and they felt that there was no one that they could tell that from. And I think that was one of the benefits of uh, uh, one of the many benefits of the law changing. One of the first counseling clients that we had at that stage, um, just after the 22nd of October, was someone who had taken a medication, accessed it online uh, a number of years previously and had never spoken to anyone about that experience and that I think everything I think this goes back to education and the fact that what we're taught and what we're not taught um we, we've come through a period many people in terms of relationships and sexuality education in school if they received relationships and sexuality education and if abortion happened to be discussed as part of relationships and sexuality education uh, it was discussed as something that was morally wrong um, and it was discussed in that framework. Uh, and we need to move away from that. And that was one of the things that was highlighted in, in the CEDAW report um, in relation to access abortion. It is one of the things that is included um, in, in that legislation that was passed, was around bringing relationships and sexuality education in, into, uh, into the 21st century, uh, discussing contraception, discussing STIs, discussing, uh, discussing sexuality, um, discussing access to abortion. And I think until we have those those conversations. I think many people's views of, of abortion will still be formed from what they've heard in the past. Um, I think few people will will now realize that the vast majority of abortion is now done medically. The vast majority of abortion, if you look at um, statistics out from, from England and Wales, 94% of abortions are in the first 12 weeks. Um, and I think it is about that wider education. And for me, that starts in schools. And, and it starts in terms of what, what we teach young people, um, that abortion is healthcare. And I think that has been one of the things in terms of the, the services that are in place currently, they've been integrated into wider sexual reproductive health services within contraception services, that whole wraparound approach. And I think in terms of we, we've now we've now changed the law, the, the biggest the, the biggest challenge will now be is around that destigmatization. Um, and for me, that starts in education. Yeah. Thanks, Rory. Um, Grania, I remember thinking, you know, when the legislative change happened in Northern Ireland, I went, Abortion is actually decriminalised here, so it means that our laws are actually more progressive than the laws in the UK. And it's like Stormont's never going to roll over. Well, the patriarchy are never going to roll over, but Stormont's never going to roll over and say, OK, girl, geez, rock on and get your abortions now. It's decriminalised. Um, so I wondered how that was going to, you know, I wondered how it was going to play out. And then I know about Paul Givens' private member's bill, and you've already mentioned Clara Bailey's private member's bill. But can you talk to us a wee bit about, you know, the relationship between Westminster legislation and Stormont legislation? Can Paul Givens bill, for example, you know, put the kibosh on the, on the bill that's passed in Westminster? And can Clara Bailey's bill be implemented to give us safe access zones? Can you talk to us a wee bit about that? So uh, I'll start with the Clara Bailey's um, point because it's, for, you know, it's a simple to address. Yes, you know, the, all, all we need is the time to be given to that legislation for that to pass and we will have safe access zones and we will bring an, a, an end to the harassment and the intimidation that many are currently exp experiencing. Like when the legislation passed, and it's particularly that point, and you know, even after all this time, I love hearing that we are the only part of these islands, you know, on one hand with decriminalisation because you know, especially when we for so long had seen it, you know, treated as a criminal justice matter, um, you know, that really was, I think, such a crucial moment. And I remember being in court the day the charges were dropped against the mother who had been anonymized, partly for some of the reasons just discussed around the stigma, you know, around this healthcare. And I remember being there when the charges were dropped. And I was just so emotional, you know, over it because, um, you know, it, that was the everyday realities that were about to be changed. You know, this woman had went from overnight from being treated like a criminal to just being able to go back to being a mother who was loving and caring for her daughter. Um, but in terms of, you know, Paul Givens' private members bill, you know, we, it's no surprise that, of course, there were always going to be those who sought to roll back and deny us our rights that we'd all fought um, so long and hard for. Not worried about the bill. The reason ultimately being is because um, the Assembly, I hope, um, don't do something foolish here and try to pass this bill. And for anyone not aware, um, really the bill is about sort of rolling back access, um, including in cases of serious, you know, fetal impairment, you know, so it's particularly, and um, we're hearing these arguments in these debates around that this is about disability. It absolutely is not. And let's never forget the fact that disabled women also need access to abortion services. But where things are with Paul Givens' bill is it has progressed through um, committee stage. I hope the Assembly don't pass it, but if they do, the bill very clearly sets at variance with the legislation that has passed through Westminster. So ultimately what we would be calling for and what we would expect, frankly, is that the bill would be struck down because it would put the Secretary of State 
um, outside of his obligations, which have now been legislated for in accordance with CEDAW. So the assembly here can't pass a bill that one isn't, um, doesn't meet human rights obligations and also then undermines um, what has passed in, in parliament. So ultimately one way or another, I don't expect that the bill will succeed, but I hope that our assembly, even before it gets to that point that they take a stand and they say, no, um, we accept the legislation, you know, from Westminster. We recognise the harm that was caused under the previous regime, and what actually we need. The only focus that we that we need to have at the minute is on ensuring that these services are as quickly as possible embedded in the healthcare system here. So um, there will be an issue there. There is a tension between the obligations that the Secretary of State is now under and Paul Gibbons' bill. Um, I think the Secretary of State has been very clear and on the public record about the fact that nothing can pass in the Assembly. That, um, that undermines you know, the obligations which have now been legislated for. So that's effectively where that is. But you know, I have to say, it is very regrettable that we do see you know, these attempts. I think for Paul Given and others, you know, a bit of self-reflection there on the fact that their own constituents and indeed the DUP electorate you know, access abortions. They have abortions, they need access to this healthcare. So this isn't even, you know, I've always found it you know, quite peculiar because even through Amnesty's work when we have done some of the research, you know, the survey and around where, you know, um, what voters want, what the public want, you know, DUP voters support this change and that includes the decriminalisation of abortion. So I think the DUP, Paul Given and others need to reflect on the fact that society is so far ahead of them on this and actually what we have now is in Ireland that I recognise, you know, where the people have always been ahead of the politicians and our politicians and our laws are finally catching up. But this is my Ireland, a current compassionate Ireland, a human rights compliant Ireland, and an Ireland that wants to see women cared for compassionately at home. And isn't that great? So as soon, as quickly as possible, these services um, are commissioned, uh, the, the better. Tonya, thank you. Alvi, I was just reflecting as well. I mean, this is in Ireland that I recognise as well in, in terms of granny, growing up in, you know, very restrictive, restrictive, well, being a woman and a feminist. But when I think of the broader issue, so I, I was reflecting on the night before, you know, the referendum result came in and the Irish Times poll had come in at 10 o'clock or whatever. And, you know, it was a resounding yes. And I was thinking, you know, is this the day that Ireland and the Irish state stops hating women? And then I was thinking about, you know, the Magdalene laundries. I was thinking about some physiotomy. I was thinking about chewing babies. I was thinking about the mother and baby institutions. <clears throat> Have we finally started to move away from this confessional state that seems to enjoy crucifying women and rejecting them as sexual beings? Well, yes. I mean, whatever about the Irish state, there is absolutely no doubt that Rapier, uh, that that night was the night that, that women and girls and a lot of other men and a lot of men actually started saying, we've had enough. We're not going to take this anymore. We're putting it up to the state actually to move. So I think, of course, um, as I, I think I said at the beginning, I mean, there is absolutely no doubt that the two referendums that we've had on sexuality and on reproductive rights, you know, um, precisely because the mechanism of control of the Catholic Church in collusion, let us say, very bluntly with the Irish state was control of sexuality and specifically of women's sexuality and women's reproduction. So once you actually confronted those and we had, as you all know, very, very long battles in challenging and confronting um, that huge control uh, system, a system of control and, and containment, which you saw in the laundries and the institution schools and so on and so forth. Uh, once you confront that and you say, we're not we're not going to be bullied anymore. Once you start up, when you stand up to the bullies and you say, we're not having that anymore. Of course, the edifice crumbles uh, because you're revealing what its um, what its foundations are. And, you know, it's very struck listening to Rory talking about the, the breaking of silence. I think one of the, the huge massive things that has happened in Ireland, certainly over my lifetime, is that, that we are no longer as people and very different kinds of people, we are no longer prepared to push things under the carpet. So we want to see responses. We want to see ourselves respected. We want to see services. We want to see rights. We want to see care and compassion, as Gronje was saying. And I mean, I think it was very interesting that, I mean, the key, one of the, the two key messages in the repeal campaign were care and compassion. The third C was change, but you never had to say that 
word change, which apparently people don't like, because if we had care and if we had compassion, it would be such a big change. So that breaking of the silence, I think it's from that that there comes the great relief. But has Ireland, I speak only for the South, has it suddenly become, you know, a country which is no longer misogynistic, that patriarchy has been banished from, I mean, was repeal a kind of St. Patrick in drag, getting rid of the snake or something? No, no, we still see the misogyny and we still see the patriarchy and we see it in our legislature and we see it in the failure of services to be provided. And we see it in the ways in which women and girls continue to experience the most appalling violence as we did during COVID. So, you know, one one referendum or one law or even two referendums and three laws doesn't actually uh, um, deconstruct the entire system. That is an ongoing process. But I do think that what we've all done across the island is really important. It is a huge milestone because we're not going back there. Whatever's ahead, we're not going back to that. And it is up to all of us now to keep fighting for the kinds of systems and structures that are really uh, careful, that are really compassionate, that are absolutely inclusive, that do not continue to marginalise and discriminate because our law does actually continue de facto to marginalise women. So, you know, it's it's fighting for that now that we're doing. And certainly down south, I mean, it has renewed our determination to fight for a health service, which is free of Catholic church control, and to fight for an education system. And I'm involved in a couple of campaigns right now, this minute, uh, to keep our national maternity hospital public and secular. So, you know, it, it's, um, it is an ongoing process, but we're not keeping quiet anymore. On the contrary, I think there's a lot of very shouting voices there. Absolutely. And that leads me on beautifully to my last point as we're as we're drawn to the close of this absolutely fascinating conversation, as I knew it would be for people watching this, for people who have been involved, for people who maybe want to get involved. Very one thing that you think that they can do that can take away to, to help us ensure that we get the reproductive rights that we want and we need um, on this island. What, what can people do? What can they do? And I, I think in my last point, I'd mentioned about, I think change starts in education. You know, while we all want to see those those wider services and, and they will um, soon be embedded uh, and we hope that they all services are available by the end of March. But I think change starts in education. It, start, it starts in society. And while we, we will hopefully be moving towards having those full abortion services, what we need to have is that sort of uh, relationships and sexuality education that, that is modern and, and is fit for purpose. So for me, it, it's, it's about... Uh, uh, people get, getting involved about uh, in their schools, getting involved, writing to their boards of governors and asking who, who is delivering relationships and sexuality education in your schools and delivering that sort of change because I think that's where change comes from. It comes from education. It will break that silence and, and help break that stigma and, and that will be the lasting change for me. Thanks, Rory. Grania? Talk. Keep having these conversations because a, a lot of the change, you know, that we've just witnessed here actually came from that challenge to the silence and to the stigma. And by having these conversations around, I support women uh, having access to this healthcare. I recognize that this is a rights issue, I've, you know, and for whoever has had, you know, an abortion saying, you know, I had an abortion, I ha I'm a mother, I have children, you know, so it's not that um, people should feel that they obviously have to declare the fact that, that, that they've had an abortion, but it is about the fact that we need to keep having these conversations because they were so critical in pushing for the change that was so long overdue. So that, I mean, I, I have to also obviously do like a shameless plug, you know, join organizations like Amnesty, join other activist organizations where they mobilize obviously on the ground as well and continue to push against any challenges that we will come up against because because we don't have you know these safe access zones yet so there and other the other points that we've discussed today there is still a way to go in this so you know get your hands dirty get involved and if you're not sure about you know reach out to any of our organizations so we're only too happy to help and you know with that it's really timely and really important that we see you know organizations like abortion talk and others obviously get established now too because that's the point that we're at now as a society so we have you know critical change in place let's keep pushing for the further change that's needed Absolutely great. Listen, thank you. Thank you all. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Alvi. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Grania. I've been Kelly O'Dade, Gurmail and Myogov, and yeah, it's been excellent. So slan, slan a while. Yeah.